Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, I want to say also, before I begin, uh, how much I'm enjoying my first trip to Korea, and it's a great honor to be invited to come to this institute uh, and, and to give a talk. I'm going to speak about a problem in the theory of nonlinear elliptic uh, equations. Uh, the basic problem is as follows. Omega is a bounded open subset of Rn. To shorten the notation, I will call x the usual Sobolev space, h1, with functions whose trace is equal to 0 on the boundary. And in that case, uh, a norm uh, on x is given by the square root of the Dirichlet integral. And with that norm, this is a Hilbert space, of course. At some points, I will also use uh, the LP spaces. And the LP norm is simply denoted by uh, a suffix p. Now, the partial differential equation that I want to discuss occurs as the Euler equation uh, for a problem in the calculus of variations, namely finding critical points of the following functional to find defined on x. Now, the functional phi depends uh, on two quantities which you can think of as parameters. One of them is lambda, which is just a real number. The other quantity uh, will play the role of an inhomogeneous term in the differential equation. So that's called h. And that's simply an L2 function, which we suppose to be positive almost everywhere on omega. So that takes care of a term which is linear in u and a term which is quadratic in u multiplied by the parameter lambda. The main term in, in the energy functional is this remaining term, which is defined using uh, a function called capital gamma. And so then we take capital gamma of half the sum of the square of u and the norm of the gradient of u squared. And the basic assumption about gamma is that it's of class C1, that it's concave, that it's 0 at 0. Since it's concave, its derivative is decreasing. And we'll suppose that the limit of the derivative at infinity is positive, which therefore means the function has a strictly positive uh, derivative everywhere. So it's a strictly increasing concave function. Now, the derivative of capital gamma will appear often. So I'm going to call it gamma, little gamma. So the concavity means this is a non-increasing function. Gamma at 0 will always be bigger than or equal to gamma at infinity, which is this limit. So just so that we remember the basic ingredients, um, this is G1. And so we can just summarize things by saying that G1 says that gamma of t, the main assumption is that it's a concave function. And it looks like this. This would be the graph of gamma. This is the straight line gamma 0 of t. This is the straight, because this is the asymptote, this is the straight line gamma infinity of t. And so our assumptions imply that gamma infinity of t is less than or equal to capital gamma of t is less than or equal to gamma 0 of t for all t bigger than or equal to 0. And this will be strictly positive if t is positive. So this is the, the, the main assumption. <coughs> Under this assumption, this, of course, this integral is finite and this integral is finite simply because u is an x 
and h is in L2. Now, this assumption tells us that this integral is finite because the integrand is bounded by gamma 0 times u squared plus the gradient of u squared. So that the integral is, is finite. So that means that this functional is well defined on the space on the space x. And in fact, it's not only well defined, it's a, a, a standard piece of uh, analysis to show that it's actually continuously differentiable and the derivative since that's something that's of prime importance I'll write out the formula for the derivative of phi at u in the direction of a vector v in x is simply the integral over omega of gamma of a half u squared plus the norm of u squared multiplying u v plus gradient u scalar product gradient v minus lambda u v minus h times v and this is true then for all u and v in x. Yeah. So that, that's uh, this basic statement about the differentiability of, of phi. We're interested then in critical points of, of this function for, for lambda and h fixed. Find the, uh, the points where the, the derivative of phi vanishes. And it follows from, an by, from this identity, you see, a critical point would be a value of u where this is equal to 0 for all v. So that's a definition of a weak solution to this partial differential equation in divergence form. There's an integration by parts which takes place uh, on, on that term and then leads to this second order uh, differential equation. So <clears throat> once it's written in this form, you see why w in, in this formulation we think of H as being uh, an inhomogeneous term. If H is zero, then you can see that this is an eigenvalue problem because when H is equal to zero, U equals zero is clearly a solution for every value of lambda because this term and this term and this term will all be, will all be zero in that case. Now, the simplest uh, situation is the situation that's allowed by our hypotheses in which gamma zero is equal to gamma infinity. You see, <coughs> this is the, gra the graph of capital gamma. If I were to draw the graph of its derivative, this is simply some decreasing function which goes from gamma zero to gamma infinity as, as t goes, excuse me, as t goes from zero to infinity. So the simplest case is the case in which the, the value at zero is equal to the value at infinity, in which case gamma is constant. And in that case, this, this differential equation, if, if this coefficient and this coefficient are actually constants, <coughs> in fact, we are reduced to um, an equation involving only the Laplacian. The Laplacian of u, a term which is a constant times u, a term which is a constant times u, uh, plus a constant uh, times h. So you can discuss this problem completely uh, in terms of eigenfunctions uh, and eigenvalues, the spectral theory of the Laplacian uh, on the domain omega with the Dirichlet boundary condition. So I don't want to uh, get involved in that discussion. That's a completely trivial uh, case. Uh, so we'll set that case aside uh, for the moment. And henceforth, I'll exclude this uh, particular linear case by supposing that as I've drawn here, gamma of zero 
is strictly bigger than gamma of infinity, and so gamma is not constant. Now, in that case, it's easy to see that one can have situations in which, excuse me, in which this equation is no longer elliptic. So the second hypothesis that I'm going to introduce about the function capital gamma is a hypothesis that ensures uh, that we have ellipticity of the Euler equation. So this <coughs> um, hypothesis, it, it, there are two equivalent forms. In fact, there are many equivalent forms of this hypothesis. Let's look at the second form first because it's the easiest uh, to, uh, to grasp, I think. If we consider the function g of t, which is simply gamma of t squared, the second hypothesis is that g of t is a strictly convex function. Strictly convex in this more precise sense that the derivative of g is strictly increasing in this way. So that will be the second hypothesis, which I'll just summarize by saying gamma of t squared is convex. Although, in fact, it's assumed in a, in, a, in, a strict, in a strict form, which is actually equivalent to this statement about the relationship between g of t and its Taylor expansion. This is the first term in its Taylor expansion about, uh, about s. These two statements are equivalent. Uh, I prefer this one because this is the one that's actually used uh, in some of, the, some of the proofs, but it's equivalent to this statement. And rho is strictly positive, absolutely. Rho is strictly positive. Now, the, the, the role of this assumption, as far as ellipticity is concerned, is that if we take the Euler equation and we suppose that we have a solution which is uh, twice continuously differentiable and that gamma is differentiable, then we can uh, expand this divergence and write the equation in such a way as to expose the second derivatives of u. So the equation is quasi-linear in the sense that the second derivatives of u appear linearly in the equation. The coefficients depend on u and the gradient of u. And then there are lower order terms depending only on u and the, the gradient of u. Now, the hypothesis G2 implies ellipticity of this differential, of this second order differential operator in the sense that if we take the coefficient matrix Aij at any value z where we put u and any vector p where we put the gradient of, of u, this matrix is positive definite in the sense that this sum is bounded below by rho, which is strictly positive, times the norm of xi squared. So this is a strong ellipticity uh, in this sense. And it's essentially equivalent, in fact, to this, uh, to this hypothesis. So these are our two main uh, hypotheses. Now, what's the motivation for looking at a, an energy functional uh, with this form? Well, <coughs> I encountered a problem in the calculus of variations which had <coughs> more or less exactly this structure in some work I did recently with uh, Zhou Huan Song from the Chinese Academy of Science in Wuhan. This earlier work uh, concerned a particular problem in the theory of uh, guided waves in nonlinear uh, dielectric materials. Um, so if one looks for a certain type of mode with cylindrical symmetry, uh, the problem of finding uh, these uh, special solutions of Maxwell's equations with a nonlinear um, constitutive relation uh, reduces to finding stationary points of this integral functional. Uh, now, this is a problem in one dimension. Uh, it's not on a bounded domain. It's over an interval uh, from 0 to infinity. Uh, but we're looking, it's on H1, it's on H1, 0. And the integral functional has similar features to the one I have just uh, introduced uh, 
that there, there's a term which is lambda times the integral of z squared, there's a term which is gamma and at least as far as the second variable is concerned, it's really gamma of z squared and z prime squared. This, there's a 1 upon 2 r here. This is because we've written a problem in, <clears throat> in two dimensions using polar coordinates. And so the, 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 what is really an integral over r2 appears as this integral from 0 to infinity with a weight r. And this brings in also, after a change of variables, this factor 1 upon r. Uh, but the basic characteristic of this problem is that the function capital gamma has this feature that as far as the second variable is concerned, which is where the, the state z is placed, is concave as a function of the second variable, but it's convex as a function of the second variable squared. So it has exactly this structure. Uh, and in fact, it, it will be a function only of this second variable in a homogeneous material. So as a special case of this, we can have this uh, first uh, term uh, uh, absent. So this problem contains some special features, namely there's a singularity at, or a potential singularity at the origin uh, due to polar coordinates and it's set on an infinite interval. Uh, we used, um, a very, of course, variational methods to find stationary points to this. And what I wanted to point out in, in the work I'm speaking about today is uh, just how much of that analysis really only depends on these two uh, uh, aspects of the, uh, of the function uh, gamma, namely convexity and uh, concavity and, and convexity. Uh, so I wanted to clarify the roles of these two uh, hypotheses by looking at this uh, somewhat different problem. So to formulate uh, the main result, it's not surprising that it's going to bring into play the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on omega. Laplacian taken with the zero boundary condition. So lambda 1 is the lowest eigenvalue of this uh, spectral problem. And I will use little phi to denote a positive eigenfunction, which always exists for such a, for such a problem. Now, you see, it's, it's not surprising that this quantity comes in. If we go back to the, to the trivial case in which gamma is a constant, this problem you could write as minus the Laplacian of u is equal to mu of u plus h with mu equal to um, gamma, so, sorry, lambda upon gamma infinity minus 1. So for h equals 0, this problem would have a positive solution. That means a non-trivial positive solution if and only if mu is equal to lambda 1. Now, mu equals lambda 1 corresponds to saying lambda is equal to gamma infinity times 1 plus lambda 1. And in fact, the theory of this, using spectral theory, what you see is that in the homogeneous case, you have a solution, a positive, non-trivial solution, if and only if lambda is equal to gamma infinity times 1 plus lambda 1. In fact, in that case, you simply take u to be a, a positive multiple of the eigenfunction phi, and you get a solution uh, of the problem. So that's for lambda e for h equals 0. For h positive, if you choose mu less than lambda 1, then <coughs> this minus the Laplacian minus mu is, is invertible with a positive Green's function. And so there will be a positive solution for every positive h. And it's a unique solution. And there will be no positive solution for mu greater than lambda 1 if h is positive. So that means you have positive solutions here and no positive solutions 
in this region. Now, what I'm going to do as far as the nonlinear case is concerned is to show you that when this happens, an interval opens up between gamma infinity 1 plus, excuse me, gamma, yeah. Where did I put the gamma? <coughs> picture I could draw it in fact like this in the nonlinear case there'll be a quantity gamma zero times one plus lambda one this is still gamma infinity no excuse me gamma zero plus gamma infinity lambda one this is gamma infinity one plus lambda one so this is the same, this is a number which is now strictly larger because the difference between this number and this number is gamma zero minus gamma infinity. So the, the length of this interval is exactly the same as the total change in, in little gamma. And this, the, a summary of the main result that I'm going to show is that in this region, there are two positive solutions. To, the, uh, to this um, partial differential equation. So, in fact, the main result can be stated uh, in the following way. We suppose G1 and G2, and we suppose that we're in the, the nonlinear case, so that this is a non-trivial interval. Let's first of all state the result for the homogeneous problem when h is identically equal to zero. First of all, well, there's a trivial positive solution, as we noted before, u1 uh, is a solution, and it's a solution which has got energy zero. But there's also a second positive solution, u2, which has got strictly positive energy. So these are two different solutions. Now, to obtain a similar result in the nonlinear case, I need um, a third requirement, which is this quantity, this is hypothesis, I'll call it G3, which is that the limit as t goes to infinity of gamma of t minus gamma prime t, t is finite. This, is a, by the uh, concavity, is an increasing function. So this limit always exists, but it may be plus infinity. So <clears throat> for the second, for the, to discuss the inhomogeneous problem, <clears throat> I'm forced to suppose that this limit is finite. In that case, there exists a constant for each lambda in this interval, you choose any lambda in this interval, then there exists a constant, capital H sub lambda, such that for L2 norm of H smaller than H of lambda, there are two positive solutions, U1 and U2. In this case, both these solutions are, are, are different from identically equal to zero, because the energy for u2 is strictly positive and the energy for u1 is strictly negative uh, but I've labeled these in the sense that um, when h goes to zero this solution becomes the identically equal to zero solution and this solution with positive uh, energy becomes the positive solution uh, in the homogeneous case. They're identified in fact <coughs> uh, in the following way in both cases, the solution that I've labeled U1 occurs as a strict local minimum of the functional for fixed uh, lambda and h, whereas the function that I've labeled U2 is characterized by a minimax principle, in fact, a principle of a mountain pass type uh, that I'll <coughs> introduce uh, in a few minutes. Uh, let me finally remark that U1, although it's a strict local minimum, is certainly not a global minimum. Indeed, 
in this interval, the functional phi has got an infimum which is minus infinity, and on any interval it has a supremum which is plus infinity. So this, uh, there's no global minimum and there's no global maximum to this function uh, phi, but we do find always uh, under our restrictions uh, a strict local minimum and then another solution which is a saddle point. Now, in, in terms of examples, the easiest way to construct examples, of course, is to take any non-increasing function gamma which has got a positive limit and then integrate it. Define capital gamma of t to be the integral from 0 to t of little gamma of s ts. This will always give you uh, a function satisfying uh, condition G1. So the simplest or a simple family of functions having this behavior is to take a positive constant and then take 1 plus t to the power minus alpha with alpha positive and then integrate that. This will give you a function capital gamma which satisfies G1. If you then for that type of function ask whether or not the hypothesis G2 is satisfied, you will find that for any fixed exponent alpha, you can always satisfy G2 provided you choose the constant A large enough. For some functions you may be able to choose the constant A equals zero, but in any case, no, not equal to zero, as small as you wish, you can't choose it equal to zero because we want gamma to be bounded away from zero at infinity. But um, in any case, uh, for any alpha, you can always choose uh, A in such a way that G2 is satisfied, but you may not be able to satisfy G3. So you will always be able uh, to arrange uh, for uh, the homogeneous problem to have the desired behavior. Uh, as far as the inhomogeneous case is concerned, uh, you, for this class of problems, that condition is satisfied provided alpha is big enough, bigger than 1. So when you do the integration, you see the, 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 the limit case where this uh, occurs is the case alpha equals 1. If you put alpha equals 1, then gamma is a constant A times T plus log of 1 plus T. So this, in fact, satisfies G1. G2 provided A is bigger than an eighth but it doesn't satisfy G3. If you choose any alpha bigger than 1, then you'll get an expression of this kind which will satisfy all of the assumptions for A big enough. So here I've chosen alpha equals 3 and it works provided A is bigger than a third, turns out. And that satisfies also this condition G3. So yeah. Or you think why there could be even more solutions? Um, well, I think that Lustermann Schnirlman theory tells you that there shouldn't be more. Lustermann Schnirlman. So, unless there's some kind of degeneracy in the problem, uh, which means that you can generate solutions by some kind of symmetry, then uh, typically there will be this situation in which there's a minimum solution, a solution with Morse index, minus with Morse index 1, which is, um, which is positive, but no more positive solutions. As the, uh, solutions with Morse index higher than 1 would be solutions that must have nodes, must change sign. You see, it's a little bit like looking at the spectral theory of the Laplacian. If, if in the case of the Laplacian, one positive, since we're allowing z the, the zero function to be counted as a positive solution, you always have one positive solution. If you're at the lowest eigenvalue, then you have one non-trivial positive solution, but you can never have any more. And it's a it's a similar non-linear manifestation of this. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, so the first, the first thing one has to do, or <coughs> the way to start, is to first of all establish the existence of, of a local minimum. 
So this can be done under more general uh, assumptions in order to get a local minimum at least for the homogeneous problem uh, we only need to suppose G1 the concavity and suppose that lambda is to the left of this quantity and then the conclusion is uh, that in fact in that case zero is a local minimum for every lambda below this quantity that's a consequence of this first little calculation which says that if we define mu sub lambda to be the minimum of gamma infinity and this quantity and this quantity is is positive if and only if lambda is less than this number so that's this hypothesis here in that case there exists a radius r sub lambda such that inside the ball of, uh, I'm sorry, I keep losing the, uh, um, inside the ball of radius r lambda, this is the ball of radius uh, r lambda in, uh, in, X, in X, um, inside that ball, the homogeneous function, the, the, the functional that corresponds to the homogeneous problem is bounded below by this positive constant times the norm of u squared. So, um, for all u inside or on, so it's in the closed ball, we have this, uh, this estimate. So, <coughs> this is already telling you that, that for the homogeneous problem, zero is a local min, is a, is a strict local minimum. Now, because uh, we have this information, uh, we can perturb this a little bit. You see, if I drew better the graph of phi sub zero, This height here, this is, this is telling us that this, so this is, this is the ball of radius r sub lambda in, in x. And here I'm, this is the, is the graph of the function phi uh, in this neighborhood uh, of the origin. So you see that it's on, if I look on the boundary of the ball, it's lying above this, uh, this circle which is all what I get if I, if I substitute r sub lambda for the norm uh, of u squared. And so any function, that's, this, th that's the graph of this function. Now the nonlinear function, phi, of course, you can think of at u as phi of lambda zero u minus the integral of u times h. So if u is, if h is small, this is a small perturbation uh, of this. So you can, by choosing h sufficiently small, phi sub lambda of h will lie above this circle on the boundary of the ball. So that's a little calculation. Uh, that's being done here. We're looking at u on the, on the boundary of the ball and saying that if we choose the L2 norm of h sufficiently small, and when, when we, you can quantify this, then in fact the, the functional corresponding to the inhomogeneous term h will be bounded below by, by, by half of this height, so it will be above this circle. And so it's strictly positive on the boundary of the ball. So now, <coughs> to, to, to prove this, um, of course, um, one first I the, the first idea one would have would be that the thing to do would be to look at the second variation of phi, since we want to prove that zero is a local minimum 
it's easy with, for the homogeneous problem. We've, we noted right at the beginning that zero is certainly uh, a critical point because uh, zero is a solution to, uh, <coughs> to, the, to the equation. This is a true statement. So zero in the, for the homogeneous problem, the, or, the, zero, the zero solution is a critical point to see whether or not it's a, it's a, it's a minimum or not. One's first reaction would be, oh, well, we'll look uh, at the second derivative. The point is that because of the quasi-linear nature of the functional, the functional phi is never twice continuously differentiable. So phi lambda h does not belong to, to C2. So um, this, this is due to the quasi-linear nature of the problem. The only case in which phi is C2 is in the case in which gamma 0 is equal to gamma infinity, that is gamma constant. If gamma is not constant, then it's, it's not uh, twice continuously differentiable. So one has to substitute looking at the second derivative uh, by some uh, uh, alternative argument. We're trying to bound phi from below. So one way to do this is to exploit, again, the concavity to say that you see, the, 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 the crucial term in the, in the formula for phi is the term that involves capital gamma. So if it's concave, you can uh, bound it below by the sum of these two terms. The term involving the gradient is trivially bounded below by little gamma infinity times t squared. That's just using this immediate consequence of g1. And then the second term we have some advantages when we're dealing with the second term because we can use the Sobolev embeddings. That's why we, we could not use the Sobolev embeddings on this term because we're in H1. So, and it, this term actually depends on the gradient of u squared. But once, once we've separated these two terms, the first term can now be treated using uh, the Sobolev embeddings. So we replace uh, gamma of u squared by it's uh, <clears throat> by gamma zero uh, of u squared plus uh, the remainder. So this ca function capital G is simply defined in such a way uh, that this is equal to this plus th uh, minus this. Um, <clears throat> so this term is actually equal to this term. Now, using the sum of these two terms, we easily get an estimate of this type. That remains, what remains then is to show that this term does not destroy uh, such an estimate. And that's then obtained uh, by the fact that this function g is zero at zero. Capital G of zero is, is, is zero and it's multiplying at u squared. So uh, an argument, an estimate which I don't think we'll look at in detail, but exploiting the Sobolev embedding, because you will see that to estimate this term, and I need to show that it can be estimated by an arbitrarily, by a small constant times the norm of u squared, so that it won't destroy the lower bound obtained from these two quadratic terms. Um, so in order to do that, uh, I need to use the fact that u is in some LP space with p bigger than 2. And so that's, this is the, uh, the way to do that. So that roughly <coughs> uh, shows us how to establish these two, these two facts. So to get a local minimum now, uh, we're going to minimize. We, we've done with the case h identically equals to 0. We know we have a local minimum. It's 0. Now we're going to minimize over the same ball So we take h not identical equal to 0, and we minimize over the ball center 0 and radius r sub the closed ball 
uh, that appears uh, in lemma one. So there are two uh, key features of phi that enable us to claim that the function phi attains its minimum on this closed ball. The first is that phi is actually weakly sequentially lower semi-continuous and that's a direct cons consequence of the fact that it's a convex function of t that, that gamma of t squared is convex. So this assumption, uh, it's, that's something quite standard in the calculus of variations, enables one to show uh, this weak sequential lower semi-continuity. The other fact that we're going to use is the fact that um, if we take any function u in H10 and we think about its absolute value, in fact, <coughs> the, the, the derivative of the absolute value in norm is equal to the norm of the derivative almost everywhere. That tells us that the, the absolute value of u is also in x. And in fact, that the norm in x of the absolute value of u is the same as the norm of u. And furthermore, as far as the homogeneous part of the energy functional is concerned, it doesn't change either because if I had written that down, you see, phi of lambda h u is equal to the integral of gamma of a half of u squared plus the norm of u squared dx minus lambda up and 2 the integral of u squared minus the integral of u times h. Now, phi sub 0 is this part. This is phi of lambda and 0. That's what you get when you put h equals 0. And you see that that doesn't change if you replace u by the absolute value of u uh, because of this result. On the other hand, this part will change. But it changes uh, in the following way. Since h is bigger than or equal to 0, it's always true that the integral of u times h is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of u times h. And so since this is less than this, this means that when you replace u by the absolute value of u in phi, you get something that's smaller. So uh, that means that if we consider a minimizing sequence in this, in this ball, it will not uh, uh, go towards the boundary because phi is less than or equal to 0 at, no, phi is 0 at 0, and phi is strictly positive on the boundary. That was, that was what we observed in part 2, in part 2 of the lemma. This minimizing sequence then contains a weakly convergent subsequence, the, the weak lower semi-continuity uh, tells us uh, that phi will attain its minimum at the, uh, at the, weak, at the weak limit. So there is a, there is a, minim, there is a, a minimizing, uh, there is a minimizing function. It can't be on the boundary because th the value at the minimum must be less than or equal to the value at the origin. So it's, so it's less than or equal to zero. So it can't be on the boundary. Um, and we may as well assume that it's positive, because if it isn't positive, replace it by its absolute value. That's still a, a function in the ball, and it'll have the same um, value of phi. So it's, one can, the, the, there is a minimizer which is non-negative uh, in the ball. And in fact, it's easy to see that if h is not identically equal to 0, then indeed phi must be strictly negative. Uh, at the minimizing function. So that, that tells us everything about the, the minimizing problem. So we've now got a minimum. If this is 
gamma zero plus gamma infinity times lambda one, <clears throat> for every lambda less than this quantity, there's, there's, a, there's a solution which corresponds to a minimum. In order to find another solution, uh, I'm going to use the so-called mountain pass method. So let me just remind you of what that is. Uh, you can take any real Banach space and any C1 function. Uh, and if you suppose that phi has got what's sometimes called or often called the, the mountain pass geometry, we can say that that means uh, there's a non-zero vector x and a radius so that when we are in the, in the space x, um, the, the minimum value of phi on the sphere of radius r is strictly greater than the values at zero and at the point e. So if, phi has, if, if you can find such a point e, then you can say that you have a mountain pass geometry with respect to zero and e. And in that case, you consider the set of all co paths, continuous functions, starting at zero and ending uh, at e. And then you define the mountain pass level by looking at the maximum that phi attains in moving from zero to e along such a path situation looks like this, 0, E, here's the path, here's the path F, this is the, <coughs> the radius R, <coughs> you look for the maximum that phi attains as you go along such a path, and then you take the infimum with respect to all possible, with respect to all possible paths. You see, this quantity then is bound to be bigger than the minimum on this circle because every path cuts the sphere uh, of, radius, of radius r. And so c is certainly bigger than or equal to this quantity. And so it is not equal to this, and it's not equal to this. Well, <coughs> it's well known. Uh, uh, <coughs> this is one way of, a, of, a, of showing, of proving uh, the mountain pass theorem uh, that's uh, well known it was proved by Ambrosetti and Rabinowitz uh, a key step in, in proving that uh, can be to show that under this mountain pass geometry but without any assumptions about compactness there always exists a sequence of approximate critical points so if we have phi that satisfies the mountain pass geometry take any set S which contains an optimal sequence of paths. An optimal sequence of paths is just a sequence of paths so that every path is contained in the set S and this should be F sub N and so that the maximum along this sequence goes to the infimum uh, which, is, which is C. Well, <coughs> in that situation you can always find a sequence UN in X so that phi of UN converges to C the derivative of phi of un converges to zero, and if the norm of un goes to infinity, in fact, one has some information about how fast it goes to zero. It can't go to zero too slowly because this product has to go to zero. Similarly, one has some information about how far un is from this set S, which contains an optimal sequence, because this ratio has to go to zero. So the numerator may not go to zero, but it goes, it grows more slowly than this denominator. Um, and so of course, if you can find from such a sequence, a convergent subsequence, you find a critical point at the level C, which lies in the closure of the set S. So we're going to, we're going to use this uh, approach to find a second solution uh, or a second critical point to the functional and hence a second solution to the, to the Euler equation. So the first, we know that we've, I said right at the beginning that phi is in C1. So the, other, the only other uh, property that one has to check 
is that we've got the mountain pass geometry. So we have to find this uh, a suitable vector E. Uh, and what this <coughs> little lemma says is that you can find such a vector E by taking a sufficiently large multiple of the first eigenfunction of the Laplacian. Because if you look at the ratio, be you, so you, you, you look at phi of t of phi divided by t squared, and you let t go to infinity, little t go to infinity, the hypothesis G1 and dominated convergence enables you to show that this quantity converges to this quantity. So this is a, a positive constant, and this coefficient is negative provided lambda is smaller than, provided lambda is bigger than this quantity. So this is what brings in the second restriction in my discussion. This is gamma infinity one plus lambda one. So provided lambda is bigger than this quantity, um, this coefficient is negative, and hence phi must be negative for all sufficiently large values of t. Now, we go back to lemma one. We know that if I look at the sphere of radius r lambda that was obtained in lemma one, where we found the local minimum, we know that phi is strictly positive on this sphere. We know it's zero here, and we've now found that it's negative at capital T times phi if we choose capital T big enough. So that means we have the mountain pass geometry. That therefore means that we have a, uh, a, a we can get a sequence of approximate uh, critical points to help us prove that this sequence of approximate critical points is bounded, I'm going to use a set S which we can see contains a sequence, uh, an optimal sequence of paths. So for S, I take the cone of positive functions in X. Now, remember that we've, in finding the, showing that the global, that the local minimum is positive, we observed that if you replace u by its absolute value, you decrease the value of, of u. What that means is that if you take any optimal sequence of paths and you replace them by the paths where fn is replaced by its absolute value, that must also be an optimal sequence of paths. And this sequence of paths will lie in S. So we can always find an optimal sequence of paths contained in S. Therefore, the mountain pass uh, theorem that I, that I mentioned this, this, uh, gives us a sequence so that phi of un goes to C, 1 plus the norm of un phi prime goes to 0, and this ratio goes to 0. What we need to do to complete the, uh, the discussion is to show that this sequence contains a convergent subsequence. Now, essentially, because we're in a Hilbert space, uh, by passing to a further subsequence, we can, we can claim that this, there is a sequence of this type which is in either the case, either the sequence is bounded and hence contains a weakly convergent subsequence and the weak limit will be in S because S is closed and convex or there is no bounded subsequence of this sequence and in that case the norm tends to infinity. So the proof now consists of doing the following things. First of all, we show that this case cannot occur. Then we will have a bounded and therefore weakly convergent subsequence then we'll complete the proof by showing that this weakly convergent subsequence uh, is strongly convergent. I think I've, what, I, what time should I, I should stop soon? Um, not yet. Yeah. I, so let me just finish this. 
uh, maybe go through a little bit of this slide and, and then, I'll, uh, then I'll stop. Okay? So the, 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 main, <coughs> the main step in what's left of the proof is to show that this cannot happen. So we argue by contradiction. We suppose that it does happen. So we suppose we have a sequence that this sequence of approximate critical points uh, has a norm that's going to infinity. So I'm going to, I renormalize it. I consider un divided by the norm of un. That's got norm one for every n. And then I multiply by a constant k, which I will choose later. Okay. For any choice of the constant k, this sequence wn then is clearly bounded. So it, we can pass to a further subsequence and say that it converges weakly to an element w. The fact that un has got uh, this relationship with the set S means uh, that we can prove that W actually must belong to S. So that's the first piece of information. The other piece of information we have is that the derivative of phi along UN goes to zero sufficiently quickly. From that piece of information, we deduce that the weak limit W satisfies this identity for every V. Okay, so that's just a consequence of this. Uh, <clears throat> it requires some work, but, but it follows from this. Uh, now, for V, we, uh, we make a choice of this test function V and put the first eigenfunction uh, of the Laplacian. And what we find is that out of this identity, we arrive at the conclusion that the integral of W times phi must be equal to zero. Now, phi is strictly positive, and w is bigger than or equal to zero. So this tells us that w must be equal to zero almost everywhere. So now we know that wn is con con converging to zero weakly in x, and therefore strongly in L2. That enables us to show that phi of wn is bounded below by this constant because the terms involving un go out, and the, the only term uh, involving the gradient of un uh, is equal to this constant. Okay. Now, in this lemma, the, the concavity of, of gamma enables us to prove this estimate. It's basically, this is uh, a consequence of saying that for a concave function, it lies everywhere underneath its tangent. So you get this inequality uh, in the case h ID identically equal to zero. From that inequality, one can deduce that the lim inf of phi of wn, excuse me here, is less than or equal to the constant c. So now in these two arguments, I've produced a lower bound for the lim inf and an upper bound for the lim sup. I can choose this constant k, I was free to choose any way I like. So I can choose k so that this number is bigger than this number. And that's impossible because now I've got that the limb inf is strictly bigger than the limb soup. So this is how one uh, shows that case one cannot occur. Therefore, we have a weekly, we've, in the case, h identically equal to zero, I've shown that this can't occur. That means we are in this case, and then the complete proof, is, the, the proof is completed by using this convexity to show that this weakly convergent sequence converges strongly. I don't have time to speak about that. And just finally, what I went through here <coughs> was the argument that one can use in the case h identically equal to zero in the case h not identically equal to zero, uh, one has to replace this uh, inequality by something a little different. And it's at that point uh, that this hypothesis G3 is required. So maybe there's a, there's a better way of uh, doing this last part of the argument, but I haven't been able to find that. So thank you for your uh, attention.